Hello, this is Tom Lavecchia with New Theory Podcast. We have a special guest today, Chris Casparosa, who is on our podcast as a rebuttal to the John A. Light podcast we did roughly a week ago. Chris, how are you doing tonight? Tom, how are you? Thank you so much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure having you. First, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're on the show. Um, I'm a writer. I'm a director. A uh, producer of sorts, and in this case, a uh, journalist. Um, a while back, I built a website outlining hundreds of lies by a government cooperator. Some people say mob rat, John A. White. And uh, you had him on your show, and I was invited to come on and uh, discuss why he's a pathological liar, and he told many lies in your show like he does everywhere. So, so we did get some uh, feedback. Uh, some of it positive, some of it negative, like anything else. And uh, part of it was uh, that there were some challenges with some of the things that he was saying, uh, specifically pointing out your website, John Lee Facts. So let's kind of cut to it. What would you say, uh, in your opinion, uh, was maybe one of the biggest fallacies or incorrect mischaracterizations that John made either on our podcast or publicly? Well, he, he, he is a fallacy. He's created a character for himself like like he says that he was this big mafia hitman hitman that's his whole thing he was a hitman and he was a multi-millionaire mobster and a big shot and he would have been a made guy if he wasn't albanian and, and all these things but the whole thing the whole thing is a fallacy he, he's a walking fraud and he has people supporting him in this fraud because he was never a hitman and he was never a big multi-millionaire and there's an abundance of evidence that backs up that so he, he is a walking fallacy. He, was, he is a lie. He's, his whole demeanor is a lie. Okay, so in, fa- in fairness, right, so he's obviously doing it for reading. Everybody has a motivation. So uh, do you think it was a reduced time, sell more books? What was the reason, in your opinion, for creating this persona? Well, I think when he testified at two RICO trials in 2009, the trial of Charles Carniglia, who the government alleged was a, uh, a soldier and a hitman in the Gambino crime family. And later that year in the fall, he testified uh, at the John Gotti Jr. crime, at the John Gotti Jr. trial, who the government alleged was the former acting boss and a captain in the crime family. And a testified that he was this big shot. He was involved in big crimes with them, murders, drug dealing, extortion, um, you know, in, into the millions of dollars. And what was his motivation? I believe, one, to convince jurors that these people were guilty by lying that he was involved in these big crimes with them. So that's why he's making himself out to be a big shot, to reduce his prison time, and to plan for the future that so he would have a book deal and a movie deal when he got out and be a big celebrity. And it's actually on the prison tapes while he's in jail. He's, he's talking to uh, his brother and trying to get, talking about getting a book deal. So he was planning it from then. Okay, so, so let's, let's be candid. The American population, even millennials, who is our focus, is just obsessed with the mafia, mafia cult, whether it be Godfather, Goodfellas, Bronx Tale, etc. And, you know, Gotti's name is up there with the Al Capone's, like Luciano, etc. Uh, but let's kind of call it like it is. Those guys were boys for a while. Um, they're, they're in photos and videos together as back early in the 80s. Um, they grew up together. Uh, they seem to make a lot of money together. Um, in your opinion, you know, as far as you know, knowing John Jr. and knowing through your research, uh, how did they become friends, and, and frankly, how did it end, or what went wrong to, for them to be kind of mortal enemies at this point? Um, according to John A. Gotti, they met in, I think, 1984 or 82. I don't remember the exact time period. Time period. Yes, it's called early to mid-80s, okay. It was like 82 or 84, and they met through his brother-in-law, um, Carmine Agnello. And a told a different story of how they met, but I'm going to stick with Johnny Gotti's. And, how they, and they were friends in the 80s, and then John says that later on, after he got straightened out, became a, a made member of the Gambinos in December 88. After that time, he, put, he started putting his own crew together, and he brought a into his crew, he says, to deal with, like, other low lives like him, like junkies in the park and things of that nature. And how did it end? Is when he realized that A Light himself was a low life in 1991, 
and there was a rumor going around that he was an informant, like another Gambino guy. Uh, his, name, his name was Anthony Trentacosta, and it's actually in a Light's FBI debriefings that this guy said a Light was a confidential informant for the police, but I guess it was never verified, and John didn't really didn't want to get him killed because their wives were friends, but he said it, it wasn't even that. Like, a Light was robbing drug dealers and selling drugs when he wasn't supposed to. It, it was just getting caught in lie after lie, and he was doing things he wasn't supposed to after he'd been warned. And he realized that what people were telling John, that this guy was a lowlife, that it was true. And he chased him, as they say, from uh, his crew, and he was no longer on record with the Gambinos. And this is all in November 91. It was right after Gravano was revealed as a turncoat. And uh, that's uh, when this all went down. And it's in the A-Lights debriefings. He says it. He, he okay, has, so, so says, just like anything else, in the 80s... came around that he was an informant. That's what he says in his debriefings. And he doesn't deny it. it. So just, just, like, just like as we understand being kind of, if you will, Italian guys growing up in New Jersey, Queens, etc. The mob was really strong in the 80s. Let's call it what it is, right? And then even in the 90s, probably up to the early to mid-90s, they still kind of had some weight. And then obviously things went down with Sammy the Bull and so forth. And things really started to unwind. So at that point, it looks like things really unwound between you know, Johnny Gotti as well as John A. Light. So John, John A. Light, as I understand, went to Tampa and then was hooked up with, I believe, the uh, one-armed Tukio or whatever his name is, who was uh, a captain uh, in, in the Gambino family, as I understand, uh, through my research. But one thing that I point out, I want to point out is, uh, during his testimony, you may or may not be aware, he actually, like, defended himself and said to the jury that pretty much both Johns were ticket thieves and were partners in the drug trade. So obviously this is a pretty um, bold statement and, a, and maybe an inaccurate statement, but this, as, as, a, as I understand, a mafia captain uh, did say this uh, publicly in court. So what do you think of maybe a third party saying, hey, those guys were pretty close? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Here's my thoughts, on it, and this is like a multi-pronged answer. Here's my thoughts yeah. on that. In a Light's interviews, right, and I forget what he said in his book, but in his interviews, and all, he's all over the place. He calls Ronnie Truccio uh, an informant, a rat, or whatever. He calls John Gotti Jr. a rat on your show. He called Jimmy Catacamo and John Burke. He said both of them were rats. These are all guys that he basically testified against or debriefed against, etc. that he gave information on. And these are guys that, like, some of them who he testified against, he got some of these guys indicted, like, and he calls other people rats when he's like the king rat. It's, it's, it, it's almost comical in a way. Um, Ronnie Truccio, I don't have his testimony in front of me, so I, I can't read it, but to my understanding, yeah. he said in his opening statement at, uh, at his trial that he's, he's like, oh, I'm not responsible for this, uh, something else, John A. Light, whatever. However, what you say in an opening statement of your trial is considered hearsay under uh, under under the law, so that can never be used in another trial. That that could never be used as evidence against John A. Light in another trial. So it's not like he wasn't considered an informant for that. He's just he's working his case. That's considered hearsay under the law, so it's inadmissible in another trial. And on top of that, by that time there were rumors in the '90s that A. Light was a confidential informant, but it, it was just never confirmed. At that time, in when he went to trial in what was it? I think 2006. I could be off on the date. I believe it was in 2006. A-Light was already revealed as a confidential informant. And now it's on the website. If you go to johnnylightfacts.com slash rat, R-A-T, that's the, the link to this one post. It's all kinds of evidence that he was a confidential informant since at least 1991, maybe earlier. I don't know, but at least since November 91. And he says that he turned in 2007 after, but no, it's since 91 at least. And... On that link on the website, you'll find the transcripts of uh, A-Light's communications with private investigators for Ronnie Truccio. The guy, the private investigator's name was Larry Frost. And in those, in those calls and in other letters he wrote home and other places, he admitted that he was meeting with FBI agents confidentially in the 1990s. And so it's like, and he was, test, he was t talking to Larry Frost and Joseph Carrazzo, uh, Ronnie's lawyer, to help Ronnie's case. So he was saying, oh, you should subpoena these agents because... I told them in the 90s that I wasn't friends with you and that I thought you were going to kill me, etc. that it, it's like subpoena the agents because they'll say, no, I wasn't with Ronnie at this time, so I could not have been involved in these crimes with you. Subpoena the agents. They'll say it on the stand. So he admitted that he was an informant already before Ronnie gave that statement. So it was just, it's comical that he would call Ronnie a rat for that.
Got it. Now, now one of the bombshells, if you will, or one of the big, um, I guess, statements, if you will, from the Gotti's Rules book uh, by George Anastasia, as well as John A. Wright contributing, was that, uh, again, this is just going for the book, that Johnny Gotti was uh, considered an informant, uh, that he had a proper session, and I believe they produced a three here too. So obviously we, we um, you know, had John on the show. I asked him to come on this particular show this evening. Um, he respectfully declined. Um, obviously we weren't able to get to John A. Gotti uh, respectfully, but what is your knowledge of the subject? Because that's kind of the crust of a lot of the issues kind of between them. So as far as you know in your research, as maybe a subject matter expert, maybe not firsthand, but as a guy who is spending a little time on it, what are your thoughts on that and also being a friend of Johnny Gotti? Um, well, that's another thing. You know, Eli says John Judy was an informant and this and that. It's nonsense. I think it was on your show last week that he said he was an informant since, like, 1982. Like, really? So it's really that never came out then? It's, uh, like, his, his story switches at every interview. It doesn't say he was an informant since 1982 in his book. But uh, as far as that proper section goes, it's nonsense because, like, what's in the 302, the paperwork, really can't be believed because... It was transcribed, like, the, the proper session took place in January 2005, I think it was, and uh, it wasn't recorded on paper, at least in this document, until January 2006, an entire year later. It, it's, it's, it is, something's really shady about that. And the government actually accused John Jr. of lying in the session, and, and that they said that it was, uh, at one point, they were saying that it was a strategy concocted by John Gotti Jr. and Vincent Basquiano, who the government alleged was the, the acting boss of the Bonanno family, that they were going to go in and give these proper sessions, but it was a sham to get to get a, uh, to beat their cases. It was part of a strategy, and that it was they said that it was approved by uh, by the bosses of the different crime families to use the strategy to give fake information in these proper sessions. But, um, and I think it was Dominic Sicali who testified that he was a captain in the Bonanno family that uh, that testified to this. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's nonsense that he was an informant because he had four racketeering trials after that session took place. Four. Where the last, yeah, one, none, none of the last one, he was facing the death penalty, and he had a parole trial, and they tried to indict him again after that fourth racketeering trial. So he had five trials that would have had more if they, could have, if they thought they could get witnesses against him. Okay, and then that is true. And then I know that um, so I did those cases that all four uh, did result in a post. All right, kind of change, uh, switch gears a little bit. Again, uh, millennials love uh, the genre of um, mob movies. Uh, I believe they're coming out with a movie uh, with John Travolta as well as some other stuff. Talk to us a little bit of your knowledge, and uh, please share your cameo experience, if you will, uh, about what movies and what they have going on. Talk a little bit about the Gotti legacy. Well, it, you know, it was fun. I, I was on the set of that movie, and it was, uh, it was cool. But it was like the last night after they filmed the last scene with uh, Travolta dressed up as Gotti. I was talking to him afterwards. We were hanging out on the set, and like I, I was with uh, Angel, John's sister, and uh, John Gotti's sister, and Tony Diuto, one of his attorneys, and we were bullshitting with Travolta. And I was asking him movie questions because you know, I'm, like, I'm, like he's a great actor. And I was asking about Pulp Fiction. I was like, oh, "What'd you think of Pulp Fiction when you first read the script?" And it was pretty hilarious. He started doing like impressions from uh, Pulp Fiction, like dressed up as John Gotti, and from uh, Get Shorty, and he was like doing the lines from it. He was like, "Oh, I shot Marvin in the face!" Like. <laughs> But uh, hopefully the movies. Are not now when's coming. that? When's that coming out? I don't. I don't. I, be, I don't believe they set a date for it yet. I think they're trying to figure that out now. They're still finishing the film. It's uh, it's in post production. But I'm I'm guessing towards the end of the year or very early next year. Um, so how's how's Travolta look as John Cena? Yeah, he looked great. He, no, he looked great. He looked the part. Now I also saw something interesting that uh, Johnny you know, Don Junior Johnny Gotti, but also did a YouTube on the Wittek Mafia to the point that. There were so many informants that they were actually kind of storing them away, if you will, or storing them away in different parts of the country. And in different parts of the country, these groups get together and kind of create, like, local crime syndicates. That's also, I believe, a project that you guys, or at least John's working on, as I think he calls it the Red Tech Mafia. Uh, if you could, could you shed a little light on that? Because I think that seems to be pretty interesting. Well, um, I'm actually working with John on some stuff. And uh, the Wittsek Mafia thing, it, it, it's interesting because it's like, like a -Light, he's a perfect example. He was released from prison. He's a, he had five years of supervised release. I think he just got off in, uh, in February. He was, 
he's not supposed to associate with other felons, criminals, especially former organized crime members and people that he was associated with in the streets or just organized crime guys in general. It's, it's, a, it's a major violation of his paperwork. However, it was reported by uh, Peter Lance and uh, attorneys to uh, a light sentencing judge, Susan Bucklew in Florida, in Tampa, where he was sentenced, that, like, look, here's evidence of him associating with known criminals and felons, OC guys, OC, I mean, organized crime. It was, like, a bunch of informants, like Jimmy Calandra, um, one of the people, his next-door next door neighbor was Sean Richard, who testified against the Lucchese and the Cavalcanti families. Like, like they lived literally next door to each other. Like, and there was, evidence was presented to the judge, like, look, they, these guys are living, they're in cahoots with them, they, they, they live in the same house, practically. Mm-hmm. And and other Steve Sergio, Michael Blutrick, all, all kinds of these cooperators, but he was never violated, so he had to have like FBI agents sticking up for him. And what I believe is that the agents, certain rogue agents, knew that he lied on the witness stand. They when they put him on the witness stand, they knew that he was telling lies. So they don't want him going back to jail because he might start going back and saying, "Oh, look." He might talk about them, like, oh, yeah, they put me on the stand knowing I was a liar. I committed perjury knowingly with their support. And, you know, that could be a big scandal, and that could get people released from prison, people could lose their jobs, you know. So I believe that, you know, he is dirt on the agents in this Witsec Mafia. Yeah, they're all together, and they're, I mean, they're probably committing crimes together all the time. On what level, I don't know. But, you know, these guys, uh, they're not helping the youth at all. It's it's kind of like uh, My Blue Heaven, if you remember that movie with uh, Steve Martin. Well, so, so Chris, yeah. What's that? I'm sorry. It's exactly my blue heaven, but they're terrorizing people. Like, like, like. Oh, I shouldn't say they, but a white specifically. He's like threatening women over the internet. It's like, like he, he he like he tried to get somebody to beat me up to baseball bat me. He called Peter Lance who has five Emmy awards. Like he, he wrote him that he was a heroin addict and he's telling lies about people. It's like he he, he slanders people. He like he's there was one girl on Facebook, one lady. He said that he was. It's, if she didn't stop challenging him, he was going to pass out her address on, on television. It's like, that's a threat. And, you know, and anybody else would have been violated for that. But apparently, you know, a White's got uh, champions in his corner. Interesting. So where did you grow up? You grew up in Queens? Yes. Would you define, without giving any names, about you all anyway, would you define the neighborhood of where you grew up as kind of like, is it a kind of a mobbed up area? Or were you kind of a little bit isolated? Uh, from that lifestyle growing up? Um, I, I'm not sure I would call it a mobbed-up area, but New York, at least at that time, it was a mobbed-up city, you know, so it's like, yeah. but it wasn't like all, it wasn't like an Italian neighborhood that I grew up, but I grew up in Bayside, so it was just like, it was a little bit of everything, it, except for pretty much like African-Americans and like Indian people, but it was like yeah. everything else. There were Jews, Italians, Puerto Ricans, a lot of Koreans, Almost everybody that I knew was mixed race. You know, like like I'd say ninety percent of my friends were multicultural. You know, so it's like, but at the same time, there were drug dealers, bookies, and doctors and lawyers. It was it was everybody. It was it was a melting pot, really. Interesting, and, and like I said, we're, we're millennial focused, and you're a millennial, and I think what the millennials have the distinction of, I believe, kind of being the last generation to even have you know any kind of connection to the mob in any way. And I think the future, future generation is just going to be kind of like Roman history. So what is your, you know, what is your take and your experience? Like, was it good for the neighborhoods? Was it a positive thing? Or do you kind of look maybe like down upon these guys, consider them, you know, maybe not great guys? What's kind of your take? Well, you know, it, it's funny. I'm thinking you got me, like, going back now. It's, uh, there were all kinds of people where I grew up. It, it was not just... And especially culturally, it was not just Italian. So it, it wasn't like one of those neighbors. There was all kinds of people there. But it's yeah. funny. I'm thinking about it now. There was like, I don't, I don't want to mention his name, but there's like somebody who the government alleges is or, or was the captain in the Genovese family. Like his daughter lived in my building. And it was funny. We all used to like joke around as kids. Like, oh, that's so-and-so's daughter. And she was hot, too. Just gorgeous, drop that gorgeous. <laughs> but like, but I, mean, I mean, beautiful. And then there was another guy that lived on my floor. He passed away, this guy, Tommy. But... It, it was, this guy was like, must have been like 75 years old, and he had like a 30-year-old Brazilian girlfriend, and like, he, this guy was definitely in the life, and he would have limos pick him up the weekends and take him to Atlantic City to gamble, yeah. and then the guy before him was like the same way, like, I think he was like another wise guy, and then there was a loan shark who lived down the hall from me who committed suicide, and it was just, 
like he was about to go to jail for like 30 years and he just took himself out and, instead but but, wow. but there were all kinds of like doctors and lawyers that lived in my building too it wasn't just that it was just I guess they were just on my floor these people but yeah. I'm thinking about it now <laughs> so, so, so it always fascinates me alright Chris so you gave us some information um, we're going to post your website uh, on uh, the article that's going to be yeah. attached to this podcast and then let the uh, listeners know uh, A, how can they find you and B, if you want to share stuff that you're working on uh, for yourself. Um, well, my website is Casparoza.com, K-A-S-P-A-R-O-Z-A. And you can find me on Twitter and also Facebook and Instagram at Casparoza, K-A-S-P-A-R-O-Z-A. And the website I built exposing all these lies of John Alight is JohnAlightFacts.com, and it's A-L-I-T-E. And uh, you can find just... Hundreds. When I say hundreds, I mean hundreds of his lies exposed on there, and I mean hundreds of his lies were exposed at trial. He, he tried to play himself off as this big gangster, but it was revealed through a mountain of evidence that he was not. And it, it's sad because you know a couple of years later, this big time author George Anastasia went and reprinted his lies, never mentioned that they were exposed, and reprinted new lies on top of them, and put this guy back into the world as like a changed man when he's not, and it's, it's bad because he's trying to be a motivator to, like, at-risk kids, and he's not. Well, you, you brought up a good point, actually. I know we're going to conclude, but I do want to bring up one more point. I, I'm, I personally am a big fan of Jordan, George Anastasia, and I historically really like his work, really do like his work. Uh, I had another pleasure reading his uh, last book about Rock and Tally, which turned out to be the first boss ever to become an informant, and the feedback has been between wise guys uh, current wise guys in the Philly mob uh, that cited that the book is basically uh, you know BS bullshit, and also that uh, literary from a literary standpoint it's getting beat up as well. So do you think if that book is less credible, does it maybe cast um, kind of a shadow, if you will, uh, on the legitimacy of Gotti's fi- you know, body files and other books in your opinion? Well, uh, that book, uh, I think it's called Last Don Standing, or The Last Don Standing, about Ralph oh Natale. Yeah. It, uh, it was actually written by, I think George Anastasia was offered the job of writing that book, but he passed, to my knowledge, he passed on it, and it, it ended up being written by a guy named Larry McShane, who was a columnist for the Daily News in New York. And I actually messaged uh, Larry recently, because George Anastasia wrote an article in uh, one of these Philadelphia magazines or websites or something calling the book fake news and saying that it was lies. And uh, Ralph, so maybe, maybe, maybe that was it. But I tried yeah. that and Ralph Vitale told one version of events on a the stand. There's a different version in his book. And I told Larry McShane, I said something to the a website. I was like, yeah, you should write an article about George Anastasia's book. <laughs> I'm like, that, that's fake news. But he declined. He said he's going to let sleeping dogs lie. So maybe there are some mis- mistruths in that book. I don't know. But... Um, but, I mean, the goal on George Anastasia to call somebody else's work fake news, because it's not just that, like, Anastasia, like, hyped up a book. You know, it's like, if you want to lie about your own story, that's one thing. But if you want to, like, slander other people with lies, because that whole book, Eli is trashing other people, and it just, and it, Anastasia gave him a platform to, to be this changed man and bring him back into society as this motivational speaker. But it's all a guise for him to get around the son of Sam law. He doesn't care about kids or anything. It's like... He can't make money off his crimes because of the Son of Sam law. So yeah. what he's doing is he's saying that he's a motivational speaker. He's there to give speeches to at-risk youth and things of that nature. Or he wants to do a reality show. So, and he'll say he's a motivational speaker, not a gangster. But it's a scam because he can't get paid for being an ex-gangster or an ex-murderer or whatever. So he'll say that he's there to do motivational speaking, but he's really there to talk about his past crimes and to lie and slander people. But under his contract, he'll be getting paid as a motivational speaker and not as... A uh, you know an ex criminal, so it's really still a criminal in my eyes. But and just to wrap that up, it's like this is beyond just slandering people and being a low life. I mean, there's evidence, and John Alight's brother Jimmy Alight confirmed this that Alight's cellmate in witness protection was Michael Blutrick, and that Blutrick wrote the first draft of Alight's book that Anastasia later rewrote. But Michael Blutcher was a guy who in the 1990s pled guilty to downloading child pornography. So what kind of changed man is John A. White? What kind of man is he at all if he would live with somebody that downloaded child porn, if he would live with them in a tiny cell? Like, that's voluntarily. You don't have to live with the guy. You don't want to live with him. What kind of man would live with somebody like that and then have him write the first draft of his book 
or at that time may have been the only writer on his book. So it's he's not a man. This so, guy, he's so Chris, it's, it's fair to say John A. White is not on the holiday card list anytime soon. Is that he's not a what? Say? Sorry. He's not going to be on a holiday or Christmas card list anytime soon. Is that fair to say? Oh, to, to my knowledge, he's trying to get a calendar going about himself. So who knows what that <laughs> clown is up to. But well, I, let, let's do this. Let's do this. I uh, Full disclosure, I've interviewed John. I know John. Um, I'm going to, on your behalf, if it's okay with you, I'm going to invite him to come on the show uh, with you. And hopefully uh, we can all sit down and talk like gentlemen. I doubt the differences will be reconciled in one podcast. I don't think it's, that's possible. But I think we might be able to, in an appropriate forum, kind of maybe iron some things out and get a little closer to uh, a happier meeting. What, what are your thoughts? You down for that? If John's in, I, I'm down for it, and I'll do it in person. You know, look him in the eye. But I know he's not going to do it because he's scared of the truth. So he's not going to do it. And and there have been other like podcasts or radio shows that I called into that he was on. And what he does is he screams, like he tries to scream over you. Were you there? Were you there? Blah blah blah. I, well, John, yeah, were you there? Because you don't show up on any of the surveillance, and you say that you spent all this time with John Gotti Sr. Not only was he under constant surveillance in the late 80s from multiple law enforcement agencies, he was under constant stalking surveillance by the press, by the media. And Ada Lake doesn't show up with him anywhere. So it's, uh, I'll be there, but he's not going to be there because he can't handle the truth. Got it. Yeah, because I know, I know there was a Vanity Fair piece on Gotti as well as Ada Lake, Gotti Sr., and I believe they had him picking them up at, you know, one of the trials. But either way, either way, I get exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, it, again, I think it's... When John Gotti Sr., it would have been, been on the cover of his book, in the inserts in his book. I mean, he, he puts himself in specific locations. He says he was with John Gotti Sr. twice at Paul Castellano's house. Paul Castellano's house in 1985, he says, I think this is in November, December 1985. At that time, Paul Castellano's house was under constant surveillance. So yeah. it, it, the FBI was parked like in the neighborhood. There were cameras around. It was like yeah. he, he was on the government, or at least uh, potentially charged with the commission. He didn't show up at that. Yeah. So interesting stuff. Well, listen, the offer will be there to John Hale, uh Chris. Uh, got to know a little bit of a few days. I'm happy to have you on. Uh, you have an open forum anytime on new theory, and uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. I, I appreciate you, and thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, buddy.